so many horrible things happen around the world, but I'll forget about that for the next bit of time. Uh, one of the things about, uh, well, the topic today is going to be genetics and Parkinson's disease. And genetics, of course, is uh, progressing very rapidly in terms of uh, understanding how genes work, how characteristics are transmitted from generation to generation. Um, but we've always kind of known that. We know that certain traits come from our grandfather and their grandfather. You can see a lineage of certain traits. So that's what heredity is about. I remember as a child, I was raised in a strict Catholic boarding school. And I was always very skeptical about the existence of an afterlife and heaven and hell. I was a kid that was always questioning what I was told, even at the age of seven. It's, that's when supposedly you reach the age of reason. You, and you're not supposed to question too much if you're raised a Catholic. You have to accept what they tell you. Be obedient. And there are a lot of things you can never understand. They say, those are mysteries. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a mystery. For example, one of the questions I asked, I'll get back to heredity, because it relates to this. I said to one of the nuns in second grade, why do we have five fingers, Sister Mary Georgina? Uh -huh. Because God wanted it that way. <laughs> so I rolled my eyes to myself and said, oh, okay. I go home for the summer and I'm with my mother and I said, why do we have five fingers? So, well, each finger has a function. The little finger is for your ear. <laughs> the first finger is for your eyes, but be careful, don't rub too hard. The middle finger is for wiping your private parts. <laughs> And this finger is for when you get married. <laughs> and she really sat down. And the thumb is the helper of all the fingers. And at least her approach kind of made sense to me. And only later on when I became a, a university student, and I was studying development of the embryo from one single fertilized cell to a complex organism. And I realized that the development of the limbs and the hands and the fingers was very intriguing. I, I was fascinated by how hands form well, into five digits. And many of our related ancestors in the animal kingdom had very similar development. In fact, if you look at an embryo at a very early stage from a human, you would be able to distinguish it from the embryo of a seal, a water mammal, for example, or a dog. It looks exactly the same. And so by studying how these fingers develop. The molecular basis for development, the orchestration of gene expression that results in morphogenesis, the formation of form and structure and function, it became clear that it's a bit like sculpture, but at a molecular level. By, there are two ways to make a sculpture. One is to build up, like with clay, and then you take away parts that don't belong, or you carve away things that don't belong. Like, as Michelangelo would say, he would just remove everything that wasn't, Mike, uh, say it was the statue of David, just remove everything that wasn't David. <laughs> that was the, the secret. Well, the same process goes on. Cells divide and divide, they form a little limb bud, and then there's a removal, pruning of cells. And there's a program that's triggered by gene expression that allows the space between digits to fall away. Apoptotic program. That is active throughout our whole life of programmed cell death. So you make a lot of cells, build up the clay, and then you remove cells through programmed apoptosis. So we learn something about molecular mechanisms of formation of the digits. So again, it's genes. So genes not only are involved in transmitting characteristics from each generation. But also genes, when they're active, are involved in development and in everything we do. So when I talk about the genetics of Parkinson's disease, I'm really talking about the inherited forms of Parkinson's disease. I'm not gonna talk about all of the molecular genetic uh, activities that create Parkinson's disease. That's a whole very complex story that is not, it's not really for this audience. But what everyone is interested in is this. I have Parkinson's disease. Is my son at risk? 
And here's, here's the story. Most Parkinson's disease, and I'm not going to define it for you because you should know by now if you've been coming here every <laughs> month, is sporadic. That means there's no family history. Um, say about 85% of the cases of Parkinson's disease have absolutely no family history. Between 10 and 15% of cases of Parkinson's disease do have a family history. But and we've kind of known that for a long time, but only since 1996 was the first gene mutation discovered and characterized that results in familial Parkinson's disease. And that mutation is now known as PARC1, like Parkinson1, the first mutation. It was discovered in 1996, fairly recently. And it was mutation in a gene that is called the alpha-synuclein gene. Now, alpha-synuclein is encoded by this gene, and it makes a protein that's very important in how neurons <coughs> talk to each other. And if you have a mutation in that gene, uh, you will develop Parkinson's disease. It just looks like regular sporadic Parkinson's disease. So this case, the first incident case of this, a family I should say, was an Italian Greek family in New Jersey that a, Leon, uh, that a number of people at Rutgers were studying because there were a lot of people in this family and they had records that went back to Greece and Italy of generation after generation of Parkinson's disease. And it's very rare to have a dominant disorder like that. Now I'm gonna talk about patterns of inheritance in a moment, but this was an example of an autosomal dominantly inherited Parkinson's disease. And that was like a big breakthrough because up till then, we've always considered Parkinson's disease to be primarily caused by environmental factors, many genes acting in interacting with those environmental factors, like the way you were, the water you drank for the first 30 years might have had something in it that interacted with your genetic background to cause Parkinson's. There's a lot of evidence that pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, etc., caused the death of dopamine neurons. And so we didn't think that genetics was very important, but we had problems explaining why there were clusters of 10% of cases that had a family history. Well, that shouldn't surprise you if the family all grew up in the same environment, you know? So they were exposed to the same toxicants. That's how we explained it. And the reason we didn't think there was much genetics is that whether you were, if you were twins, uh, which are identical twins, you have the same amount of DNA, the same identical pattern of DNA. Uh, so one twin would have the illness and the other might not. So that kind of made it seem it wasn't genetic <coughs> until this great discovery of the alpha-synuclein mutation or part one. So the interesting thing is the, that immediately every person who had sporadic PD in academic centers underwent this genetic test to see, well, maybe it's present in all our Parkinson's patients, but it's not expressing itself. Well, the mutation was not found. It's a very, very rare mutation. We rarely see it. There was recently another called PART4 that is like similar to PART1, and, but it's, it's and, and it, again, a very rare, but it's autosomal dominant. But two years later, another pattern of inheritance, another gene was discovered, they call it PARC2, or the Parkin mutation. And this was found, and this is much more common in uh, Asia, um, Japan and, and, and uh, China, Korea, the, of, of a pattern of Parkinson's disease that begins young, less than 40. They have the same characteristics as that old, you know, old, older onset Parkinson's disease. They begin with tremor, rigidity. Most often they begin with dystonia, with a posturing, the turning into the foot or the toes going up at a young age. And they're very sensitive to levodopa. They get remarkably better. But the pattern of inheritance in, the, in that form of the disease was a uh, autosomal recessive. That means that you needed a copy of the mutation from each of the parents. So you needed a father who carried the, one of the chromosomes with the Parkin mutation and a mother with the same mutation. And about 25% chance that a child would have both of those mutations. Whereas in an autosomal dominant, it's only, all you need is one 
of the genes to be mutated. So a child of a parent with the disease has a 50% chance. So the frequency of autosomal dominant is much higher. It'll be 50% probability if your father or mother has a mutation in alpha synuclein, then each child's risk is 50%, and, and so forth. Whereas if your mother and father are carriers of the Parkin mutation, each child's risk is 25% of developing the same disorder. Uh, and again, in that situation, in both kinds of Parkin mutations, um, Parkinson's disease mutations, the phenotype, that is what we see, the clinical presentations are very, very similar, with one exception with Parkin. And when they look at the brains of people who had Parkin and then they died, they don't have Lewy bodies. Whereas sporadic Parkinson's disease has Lewy bodies. Now what is a Lewy body? These are, we talk about it all the time, these are misfolded proteins that accumulate in neurons, especially in the substantia nigra, but they accumulate throughout the brain that cause the disease. And the fascinating thing about Lewy bodies, which were first described in 1913, is that they're loaded with mutated alpha-synuclein, with abnormal. And when the mutation of alpha-synuclein occurs, that's the first genetic mutation I told you about, discovered in 96. It forms the alpha synuclein that is abnormally folded and is incorporated into Lewy bodies. So there's something going on in Parkinson's disease that's not hereditary, for example, sporadic, that can occur in anywhere uh, without a genetic disease. But you end up with the same alpha synuclein being mutated. There are many things that cause the alpha synuclein to misfold. And pesticides, herbicides, so the fascinating thing was by learning about this mutation, it supported the concept of the importance of Lewy bodies. Until the second mutation was found, and there's no Lewy bodies. That really upset all of neuroscientists. It doesn't make sense, because it looks just like Parkinson's disease. But they have no Lewy bodies. So then it caused everyone to recalibrate. Should we really? define Parkinson's disease by the presence or absence of Lewy bodies. And a lot of people say that's not so important to have Lewy bodies, but we can call it as Lewy body Parkinson's disease, which is the majority of hereditary and sporadic Parkinson's disease. There's just a few cases of genetic Parkinson's disease where the Lewy body is not detected. So Parkin 2, the young onset autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance, that is an example. And then there are a number of, since 1998 till now, a lot of time has gone by, but very little time if you think of the, how fast technology and science advances, but it's, it's pretty fast that now we have 28 chromosome genes that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Only two of them are very strong in that, that if you have that mutation, you know, if you, for example, alpha synuclein, if you have that mutation, then you have a 50% chance of getting it. Your children have a 50% chance of having an illness, or if you have autosomal dominant recessive Parkin, 25% if both parents are, carry the gene. But there's a number of, there's, let me see if I can find this to you. Yeah, the other, the other uh, disorder there's one other disorder, uh, mutation that was discovered much later, and it's called LARC2. LARC is an acronym, it's a mouthful. It's, I memorized it because it's a challenge. You know, the more you force yourself to memorize, the better it is for your long-term cognition. So when I have acronyms, I always say to myself what they mean. So LARC2, leucine reach repeat kinase 2. And I know what each of those words mean, but just the idea is that LARC2 is an autosomal dominantly inherited Parkinson's gene mutation. So that one is a lot more common. And so if you have that mutation, chance that your child will have it is 50%, just like PARC1. So uh, I think LARC2 is called PARC6, because there's 18 different ones now. They have I actually brought a table. Uh, I'll tell you, because that's an important one. The reason it's important is some of those LARC2 mutations, when you look at their brains, they don't have Lewy bodies either. 
And secondly, if you, unlike alpha-synuclein, which is a part one, first one discovered, uh, this LARC2 can be found in people with sporadic Parkinson's disease. In other words, people with no family history, and a certain fraction of them, you'll find the LARC2 mutation. It seemed to be a spontaneous mutation. It didn't come from the family. So that's an interesting case. So every now and then you'll have Parkinson's disease. And the reason that we know it's LARC2 because they, they were included in a study. And you'll see now, now whenever we have uh, people interested in the genetics of Parkinson's disease, they'll look for LARC2 quite often. Because it's, it's one of the more common genetic mutations associated with sporadic PD. And the fascinating thing that's a, fra a proportion of those cases don't have Lewy bodies. So there are two situations with genetically determined Parkinson's disease do not have uh, Lewy bodies. So for all of the emphasis on Lewy bodies, we're starting to think about it again. Now, there, the, I told you the PARC2 is autosomally inherited. The PARC7 and PINK1 Pink one is known as Park Seven, and you know what? I don't remember what Pink one is. I always think of that popular performer. I don't know if you've heard of Pink, but I, I can't help but think of her when I hear that gene name. But it's called known as Park Seven, and in that Park Seven is like Park Two, which is inherited from an autosomal dominant recessive pattern. So the parents of an individual with this kind of genetic mutation, each of the parents carries one copy of the gene. And then the majority of the other genes that have been described are risk factor genes. You can have mutations of, in those genes and it doesn't mean you're invariably destined to have Parkinson's disease. It means that the risk of having it is increased. Um, so when do I order genetic testing? For Parkinson's disease? That's the next logical question. First of all, is it necessary? You treat them the exact same way as for added Parkinson's disease. The only reason you would do it for either research purposes, because you see there's a cluster of family members with the illness, like many patients say, well, my brother has the illness and my uncle had it. Should we get genetic testing? I said it, it might be worth it. But it's an expensive thing to do. Um, it's not a 23andMe $99 assay to cost a thousand, two thousand bucks to get those tests done. But Athena Laboratories Commercial Genetic Testing Lab will allow us to do genetic testing for individuals who have familial Parkinson's disease. By familial, I mean there's a cluster of people in first degree relatives, like mother, aunt, brother, sister, child. Who, who develop Parkinson's disease. In those case, cases, you might want to know what is the gene genetic mutation that you have. Eventually, why that will be important is that with advances in gene therapy, we might be able to modify gene expression and then prevent the illness in the future. So I think eventually we'll be doing a lot more genetic testing for Parkinson's disease. Right now, it's not something done routinely. It's something done at the discretion of the physician, depends on their academic background and interest, and, inter and for the patients. Now, some patients will be referred to centers like at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. They're very heavily into the molecular genetics of, of neurodegenerative diseases. So I would, if you want to learn a lot more about the genetics of Parkinson's disease in your own family, I might refer you to, to those uh, investigators. Um, let's see what else I can think about. Oh yeah. What's, what's fascinating to me is when I started in this field, I got into Parkinson's disease research because we were convinced it was completely caused by environmental toxicants. So I had trained as a pharmacologist, toxicologist, and did my PhD on, on, in, in this field of neuropharmacology. And then when I was a neurology resident many years later, there was a report, in, this is 1983, I was a neurology resident, a report of young people developing Parkinson's disease on the West Coast. And they were all less than 30, and they all were IV drug abusers, and they were using the same source to, of drug that was known in the, in the underground, the black market, as China White, who was a new imported 
form of, uh, quote, heroin. And what it was really was locally synthesized designer drug to act like Demerol or Meperidine. And it's a very simple procedure. Now it's very difficult because the, the uh, source material is highly controlled. But in those days, it was very easy for an underground chemist to make a batch of China white. And they, if you overcook it, overheat it, in the process of synthesizing it, you made something that contained a material called MPTP, methyl phenyl tetrahydropyridine. It's structurally similar to meperidine to some degree, to Demerol, but when it's metabolized by MAO, which is monoamine oxidase, into MPP, it looks like dopamine and is taken up by dopamine neurons where it accumulates and it kills them by poisoning the dopamine neuron mitochondria. So this was happening in 1983. Not the whole story, but the discovery of IV drug abusers who developed Parkinson's disease. So I, uh, some of the early research I did right out of residency when I was learning about Parkinson's disease at the University of Miami doing a movement disorder fellowship, I began to look at all kinds of environmental toxicants, <coughs> all environmental chemicals found in the environment, in the water, in the soil, in, in certain plants, that look structurally, chemically like MPTP. And one of the first we looked at was Paraquat. Many of you have heard of Paraquat. Paraquat looks just like MPP, but a double-headed MPP. And MPP, remember, is the active toxicant that kills dopamine neurons. Paraquat was used, uh, it's used as an herbicide. And it was used by the federal government to spray the national forests in California and, and other parts of the West where hippies were growing large amounts of cannabis or marijuana. So that was a way to control the marijuana market <coughs> way back in the 70s. So Paraquat, very toxic, and it, the reason it doesn't cause Parkinson's disease like MPTP does is it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. But in certain conditions, it would. So what I'm afraid of is many of these young hippies that are now approaching retirement age that have used cannabis for years that has been contaminated with MPTP, and now they have the effects of this paraquat. Um, so I'm just trying to tell you why so many people focus on environmental toxicants, because we didn't think there was much genetics involved other than modifying how you react to these toxicants, how you metabolize the toxin. The next set of toxicants we found were, were pesticides, not herbicides. And one of the ones that, that I found in post-mortem brain tissue of Parkinson's disease from the National Parkinson Foundation Brain Bank was dieldrin. Dieldrin was banned in 1970. Dieldrin was used for termites and various uh, insects, pests but it was found to be associated with, like DDT, which was also banned. It's very similar to that. It's called an organochlorine pesticide. DDT is the most commonly used. And DDT and dieldrin were banned in the US because it was affecting the eggs of the eagle and of the osprey. They're very fragile. And might be associated, and was associated with increased risk of liver cancer. So that's why DDT, even though you probably, you're of the right generation, where they'd spray DDT, especially if you're in the mosquito areas, you run behind the trucks as they were spraying. Uh, you know, I remember even as a kid, seeing those trucks go by in, in Miami. So, so people were exposed to DDT. Now here's what I found in the brain. Every brain I looked at, there were age-matched controls, people who didn't, Parkin didn't have Parkinson's disease. I took a positive control being people with Alzheimer's disease, the same age and sex, and Parkinson's disease. And what happened is the DDT is found in everyone. Everyone accumulates it because it's so <coughs> lipophilic, it stays in your fat tissue for life, practically. But it didn't seem to be associated with either disease, either Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It was equally present in normal brain, Parkinson brain, all, the one that was really high only in the Parkinson brain was dieldrin. And dieldrin is banned, but it stays in the tissue for decades. And, what's, and it stays in the soil for decades. And the, the sad thing is that dieldrin was 
still being used in Latin America. For example, many of the grapes we import from Chile may have been exposed to dieldrin because there's, there's no way of knowing. But we know that it's not banned in those countries. So I always say be careful when you eat grapes imported from Latin America, even though it hurts me. I'm Latin American. But, but I, I don't like the idea that we're just not better control over the use of these pesticides. And, and what's happening in this country is going to be the same because of our current administration that is dismantling the EPA. And no regulation let people make as much money as possible. You get a better crop. If you spray with pesticides, don't worry about the human issue. Don't worry about that. We've got to increase profit. This is what America's about. Profit. Stockholders got to be happy. So anyway, so Dieldrin led to uh, research in my lab where we found that it was toxic to dopamine neurons in cell culture. But when we gave it to mice, it didn't really destroy dopamine neurons. And, but the Department of Defense was really interested in environmental chemicals that might cause not only Parkinson's disease, but also ALS. And there was a, because of the first desert storm, there's a number of grants that were given, and they underwrote research that I did. And we looked at 30 different environmental chemicals. We found the number that were associated with Parkinson's disease. So this is all before 1996. And since 1996, when we now know that genetic factors are important, the trend is to look at how certain genetics uh, increase vulnerability to some of these toxicants. Why that is important is based on one of the studies we did. There's a town in Mississippi, Clarksville, Mississippi, where cotton is king, where there are a lot of cotton growers. And I had written an article about pesticides and Parkinson's disease. And I said, all I need is a cluster of people who are exposed to dieldrin and other pesticides that have a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease in their community, an epidemiological thing. And I got a call from a physician, small family doctor physician in Clarksville. He said, a lot of people in this town have Parkinson's disease and they're all related to the cotton industry. Um, they're either the landowners or they spray the crops, etc. And you know, now cotton harvesting is, is done with machinery and so forth, but the spray constantly of these pesticides results in everyone being exposed. So he sent me blood samples from people who were actively involved in spraying, people who just never even went into the fields and just lived in the town. Uh, and the ones that had Parkinson's disease were labeled and the ones that didn't have Parkinson's disease were labeled. And I predicted that individuals who were exposed to these pesticides are the ones that are gonna have really high levels. And to my surprise, the normal controls, you know, the people that didn't have Parkinson's disease but who were exposed to the pesticide had equal levels of dieldrin and a couple of other ones uh, I can get some of the other, there are about 18 pesticides, and we screened them all. We had a very active toxicology lab, and it was no different than the people who had Parkinson's disease. So it was a big disappointment. I wasn't able to find out which chemicals that people use increase the risk of Parkinson's disease in a real life situation. And then it turned out that more and more was being learned about mutations in how the liver breaks down chemicals. You know, we have two major systems that protect us from environmental invaders. We have an immune system that recognizes large proteins and viruses and bacteria and recognizes them, and if you're exposed to them again, go after them and get rid of them through lymphocytes, macrophages, etc. That's the immune system. However, we have a chemical system in the liver, very complex, called the cytochrome P450 system. There are hundreds of genes that mutate constantly that will recognize, that are involved in the metabolism of small molecules. That means that weigh less than 300, 400. Whereas proteins weigh in the thousands, 10,000s, and viruses, that you need the immune system for. But the liver metabolic system, 
recognizes chemicals, it's involved in breaking down toxicants and materials that we take in normally. That's where all drug metabolism is being taken, is takes place, where alcohol is metabolized, where everything is metabolized to make to be made into a water soluble form that can be eliminated in the urine. That's what liver does. It, you know, you think of it detoxification and there's a whole series of, of enzymes that do this. But those enzymes, the genes that encode those enzymes can mutate. So there's a genetic basis for how we deal with environmental chemicals. So this is the kind of genetics of Parkinson's disease that you usually don't hear that much about. It's because it's more influenced by environmental toxicants rather than pure genetics, pure heredity. Uh, and so in order to develop Parkinson's disease, I think you need a combination of certain predisposition, often having to do with how you metabolize chemicals, and exposure. And in some cases, doesn't matter what the exposure is, the genetic mutation will just cause the demise of dopamine neurons. Those are the, the things I spoke about in the beginning. There are 28 of those that can result in increased risk, and about six of them that were, it'll be definitely in each generation. Um, I, th I have a few more comments about that. Uh, what's fascinating too is how did this liver enzyme system called cytochrome P450 system that's involved in metabolizing drugs, chemicals from the environment, certain molecules that we ingest from plants. Now, plants are the biggest source of pesticides. In natural pesticides, you know, every plant has a defense system. Some of it is very fragrant, some of it is to attract insects, some to repel. And when we eat plants, we're taking in a certain number of toxic materials. But if you recognize how we've evolved, now, I don't want to insult people, but we've evolved over millions of years with the plants. And we've been ingesting plants over millions of years, and so we've co-adapted to the toxicants that plants produce. Even still, there's a number of plants that we never adapted to that will kill you. The belladonna alkaloids is a good example. Curare uh, is another example. There's a lot of plants that have high levels of cyanide will kill you. We've never adapted to those. But the majority of toxic materials in plants we've adapted to. And how do you adapt to something? It's not just by living next to it. It's that all the time you have mutations in that system. So individuals who had mutations that were favorable in terms of being able to metabolize the plant material that you ingested would result in more children in that family because they didn't die young, young from that plant toxica. So that's how evolution works. There's always some mutations and then environmental exposures and then there's a pruning way of individuals that didn't have the mutation. So you end up with the most adaptive uh, set of genes possible for the current environment. Um, so something that seemed real simple, the hereditary basis of Parkinson's disease is actually extremely complex. And the way I like to end it, and I'll end it this way, is how does something like intelligence inherit it? How does that develop? And why are some people so good at math and can do all of these really elaborate cognitive activities that make them seem super smart and others not? Well, a lot of it has to do with the genetics. There's some genetic mutations that allow you to be better at interpreting rhythmic sounds and tones, so you may have perfect pitch, so you're, you're more likely to be an excellent musician. And some mutations might make you more capable of dealing with abstract concepts and mathematical concepts. But those are the starting points, that's the genetics. Or there might be mutations that determine how big or small you're gonna be, <laughs> not just for intelligence. Um, there definitely, those are very strong mutations that determine one's physical characteristics. But the key thing is nothing happens in genetically alone. Everything needs the environment that changes over time. <coughs> so, when you're in an environment that supports, say, mathematical thinking, 
You're in an environment, an academic environment where your father's already a professor, you go to really good schools, have great teachers, and you happen to have this genetic mutation. Well, you're gonna be the next Einstein, perhaps. You know, or something, you'll, you'll, you'll develop that skill because of the environmental influences at a certain time in life and your genetic endowment. The same, now, I inherited short stature genes. Everyone in my family is short. My father, who was five, my size, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five. he decided for his third wife he's going to marry an Amazon. <laughs> he married a Swiss-German woman from Basel who was about 5'10". I remember he was already 40-something and had two kids. So I have a half-brother and half-sister who are over, well, the brother is 6'2", and my sister is 5'8". <laughs> you know, so this is, this is how genetics can influence, uh, you know, stature. And all of us have roughly the same intelligence, okay? That's what we like to think, okay? So that's it. I, I, it's, nothing is one thing or the other. It's always complex. I'll, I'll answer one or two questions, and I'm going to go prepare for the clinic. Yes? Um, what, what role do you think acid might take play in, in environmental causes? I missed the first. Acetone. Acetone. Well, acetone is an organic solvent, and organic solvents have been known to increase the risk of Parkinson's disease out of several Italian studies. Any organic solvent, not just acetone, but acetone is more notorious for causing liver cancer. I, I was a chemist. I took four years of chemistry, and we used acetone in oh, yeah. water. Yeah. And I'm and wondering if that has some effect on it. it, it I'll reiterate, yes, she was definitely, it depends how much and the, the total amount that you were exposed to and maybe some genetic factors. But we know there's been a paper published that said uh, furniture refinishers who use a lot of organic solvents and other people who are painters, for example, and even mechanics who use a lot of grease cutting solvents have a higher risk of Parkinson's disease. But so do people exposed to heavy metals, welders, exposed to uh, smelters, iron workers, uh, people who work in agriculture, pesticides, herbicides, all have higher risk. The acetone is probably the smallest risk of all of the other risks that I've spoken about. Wait, one more question. Chlorine? That's good. We all take chlorine in the form of sodium chloride. You know, I mean, it's essential. Too much is to give you high blood pressure. But mercury, mercury exposure in high levels, especially organic chlor uh, mercurials, will cause cerebellar ataxia. There was a great epidemic called the Miniyata Bay epidemic in Japan. It was after the war of World War II, where a whole bunch of organic mer mercurials, this is mercury bound up in organic chemicals, were dumped into the bay. The fish accumulated all of this, and then people eating that fish developed ataxia, cerebellar disease. And so mercury can cause cerebellar ataxia. We were worried about that in the Everglades. We saw a couple of Seminole Indians with cerebellar ataxia, and we were worried about the levels of mercury in the Everglades. Quick question. My father's sister had a bad case of Parkinson's. I have Parkinson's. Is my daughter, like what percentage of risk is she possibly? The risk overall for anyone by the age of 70 of having Parkinson's disease is one to two percent at most. Her risk is double, so her risk would be four percent, which means she has a 96 percent risk of not developing it. So. Good odds. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna end here, but I, at least I got you thinking, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.